The Pixel 8 Pro is pretty great, yo. I'm kind of a poet. I'm sharing some early thoughts on using Google's newest phone here. Disclosure right up front, my review unit was supplied from the folks at Team Pixel, hashtag gift from Google, and no editorial influence was offered, accepted, or requested from Google or associated PR in shooting this video. It's a solid phone. Google makes solid phones. I'm not gonna blow anyone's mind there. It's an evolution on the Google-y flavor of an Android phone and is best appreciated by the folks most tapped into Google services. I'm just about two weeks in and I'm falling into that familiar pattern of breaking in a new Pixel and appreciating what a good communicator phone Google makes. The assistant integration, the call screening, all of those little software bits and the things that still kind of feel like magic, like how good the speech to text and transcription and translation abilities are. Now, first up, a little bit of housekeeping. I don't take phones out and about without cases and protection. So I'm really happy to see that Google dropped curved glass for the front display. Instead, they're opting for just a slightly taller aspect ratio than the Pixel 7 Pro. And if you think there's a massive functional difference between a 19.5 by 9 screen and a 20 by 9 screen, you're wrong. There really isn't. They're very similar. Only now I don't have the edges of the display starting to warp sideways. And navigating and touching small controls and apps at the borders of the screen, that's all easier. And I can get away with using a less expensive glass screen protector. I did not skimp on the case though. It's still not as common to see proper enthusiast and photography brands making accessories for phones other than Samsung and Apple. So when we get a good case or accessory for a Pixel, I try to vote with my wallet. From the Pixel 6 and 7 Pro, I opted for a Peak Design case and happily this year, Peak Design is adding more colors to their lineup. Their case is a little like the old fabric case, but with a handy little magnetic bracket. And Peak Design sells numerous mounts for tripods and cars and bikes. It really is a great little system, especially for a phone that you might actually want to pop on a tripod. This video, not sponsored by Peak Design, I've, I've really spent my own money on all this stuff. So this is what my Pixel looks like when it's out and about, not always with the bracket on there. But now we can get into the actual phone, and these are still very early thoughts. It's always important to remind people that phones are a conversation in progress, and Google has consistently demonstrated an evolution as their products get updates. The transition from Android 11 to Android 12 was pretty miserable, but since then I think we've been seeing more consistent progress and polish. And if you're watching this video even a month after I've published it, it's likely the experience has already shifted from what I'm talking about today. I love the googly bits of this phone. What Google does well is showcased on the Pixel 8 Pro, and there's some interesting potential to be unlocked in future patches and updates. There's a vision of the Pixel where the hardware and software work together, are designed for each other, and I think we're starting to realize some of that potential. The weakest parts of the phone are still the pieces that are a little out of Google's control. The samsung e bits, and some of the concerns we still might have with performance. Google's game can't be the total performance win this year. That's not why you buy a Pixel. Tensor 3 is a bigger step than I was expecting year over year to catch some of these performance deficits. But in terms of raw compute power and gaming performance, Qualcomm and MediaTek have the more powerful chips this year. We're always gonna have that caveat there. A Pixel is solid for gaming, it's pretty good. But an 8 Gen 2 or a Dimensity 9200 will be better at the more graphics intense titles and for emulators. Where Google has always been strong though, making custom components to chew up image data, and their big claim this generation is the AI. I still haven't found a good way to demonstrate these AI claims in real world tests. If you have an actual app or service that we can use consistently across different phones to test machine learning capabilities, please, Drop me a comment down below. I'm underwhelmed with the idea of leaning on Geekbench ML. I'm not a big fan of synthetic benchmarks to describe differences, but running an NNAPI test, the Pixel delivers a score more than three times higher than what I could get out of a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. I have no way to quantify what the real performance difference that score represents, but for folks complaining about the Pixel's generative AI performance and, oh, sometimes Sometimes you need to wait a second for the phone to produce that image or edit. If it's truly a machine learning application, the Pixel is likely going to be faster at that task than 
other Androids of this generation. It's the strength and weakness of the Pixel camera. In terms of optical performance, it's not that much different than the Pixel 7 Pro's cameras. The improvements are largely coming from image and HDR processing. The phone crunches a lot of information after you hit the shutter, but this means it's really easy to fill the phone's buffer. This is probably not the phone you want if you have to shoot multiple or bursts of photos in a single situation, but it's one of the most sure-footed phones of the year when you hit that shutter. It's another step improved in balancing highlights and lowlights, increasing dynamic range, and using some fun processing tricks to reduce things like motion blur. Google perfected the process of take phone from pocket, tap shutter, put phone back in pocket, and the Pixel 8 continues that track record. Where we flip performance is when we talk about radios and battery life. This is where the Pixel still needs a little hand-holding over some of the competition, a little more management from the user. I'm not encountering the same spikes in thermals that I saw while using the Pixel Fold. <laughs> in fact, going from the Pixel Fold to the Pixel 8 has been a noticeable improvement there. A refined chip, a refresh to the Exynos modem from Samsung, these, these elements help. But I've also been using the OnePlus 11, and the Qualcomm performance has been a bit cooler. That's the most painful transition going from a OnePlus to a Pixel. Things like charging speed and heat. A OnePlus 11 charges significantly faster and it stays cooler while doing it. The OnePlus 11 lacks wireless charging, but it matters to me a lot less when it only takes five minutes plugged in to top off your phone for basically a day of use. The Pixel's quite a bit slower. Uh, this really falls into the camp of charge it every night kind of phone. And in that immediate moment, taking the phone off of a wireless charger, especially a wireless charger, or even sometimes if you unplug it from a cable, you're already at an elevated elevated temperature, and that can slow performance like the camera. You're going to see that if you charge this in a phone mount, in a phone cradle, maybe you've got some heat coming off your windshield, you go to unplug the phone, and if you immediately need to jump into that camera, you're not going to get a lot of shots before the camera shuts you down. All phones will reach some kind of thermal limit that impacts performance, but that's kind of the worst case scenario for the Pixel 8 Pro, especially if you live in a climate like mine, Southern California, where even here in October, we're still hitting days in the high 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The processor is running, the battery is warm and charging slower than I would like it to, the screen is super, super bright, and you've got that 5G radio connection just hammering performance on all fronts. It's kind of up to the user to manage all that for when you really need to dig into the camera. I recently did a live test on the podcast, my podcast every Monday, and the improvements on shutter speed coming from Xiaomi's and Vivo's and Oppo's simply stunning. But we know that the Pixel is crunching up a lot more information per shot to get those tasty colors, that fun dynamic range, the correct skin tone, and to fix those faces when my daughter's running around with her friends. So, Pixel 8 Pro, two weeks in. This is an interesting conversation. It's an ongoing conversation, and it's going to be one of the trickiest aspects of reviewing phones moving forward. Too many tech reviewers out there conclude a phone in the first weeks after it's announced. Increasingly, consumers are wanting to hold onto their phones longer, and the promises of this phone can't be fully understood until we see how Google handles some of that support. We can't sit here and say, we're reviewing this for the average consumers, when average consumers are wanting to hold onto their phones for more than two years. What I'm not so concerned about is the performance, considering years of updates. It's not very common, but we've been able to get three and four years of solid updates out to mid-ranger phones running mid-ranger chips. New versions of the OS and new app updates, they get heavier all the time and more graphics intense all the time, but they haven't gotten so heavy that those older mid-ranger phones just become unusable. I've got Snapdragon 600 phones from six and seven years ago that would still be snappy little communicators today if they could get a little polish. It's far more likely that performance issues are going to come from battery degradation long before we have to worry about the SoC being so outclassed to run future software. As where I feel techies can get a bit lost in the weeds, talking to other tech enthusiasts. Sure, we're sitting here talking about some of those finer differences between Tensor 3 and Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 and Dimensity 9200, but I think Google is making some smart decisions highlighting some fun features that should broadly appeal to consumers and still leaning on some of those lifestyle aspects like call screening that make an impact in someone's day. And you always win a lot of goodwill sharing photos from Pixels 
amongst your family and friends. So now for those of us who really take the pro name in a pro phone seriously, we have to hope that a few more of those power user features will find their way to this phone here, where we've been long overdue features like video output through the USB-C, and being able to turn our phones into webcams for our computers. There are going to be a lot of expectations on those feature drops over the next coming months. And of course, I would like to hear from you, can we sell a phone today, a premium tier phone today, on services, the promise of software and hardware optimization? What do you think is breaking through for consumers as the Pixel line is building more market share in all the regions where it's being sold? Drop me some of them tasty hot takes underneath this video and maybe smash that bell icon on your way down. There's gonna be plenty more to say about Pixel 8 Pro as we start getting some of these updates. I'm gonna have a camera deep dive where it's gonna be really fun to talk about some of those processing differences, and we're gonna to have to be really critical to see if we're gonna get some of those improvements for video output and high-res audio that we've been promised. Stay tuned, folks. We're just getting started. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been absolutely amazing. Those of you who are catching my home site, somegadgetguy.com, clicking on links in video descriptions, or maybe joining the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the Omniverse, and they get exclusive access to my camera deep dives when they get produced. I'm waiting on one more little polish update before I really put this phone to task. They're basically the best, and literally none of my coverage would be possible without their support. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet, at some gadget guy, basically all over social media, but these days, I'm spending a little more time on the Mastodons, a little less so on the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the Twitters, and I will catch you all on the next video.